Hello, this is Matt on the Moon Lambeau channel. As it pertains to the entire cryptocurrency asset class, unfortunately, the future is probably a lot more fragile than you think, or at least most people think. And not to be an alarmist of any sort, but I want to be living in a, a world that's grounded in reality. And so a couple things that I'm going to share with you in this video. There's, there's a comment made on the official library account and it's it may sound really bleak on the surface. And again, like I said, not to be an alarmist, but the idea itself may be concerning to some, and I can certainly understand why. But it put the reality of the SEC v. Library case and thus the future of crypto into perspective. And that case is absolutely going to impact to some degree what happens in the SEC v. Ripple case. And so it's going to impact every single XRP holder. Now, the good news on that front, at least, is that Whatever happens in the library case, it's not that it's going to be binding on what happens in the SEC v. Ripple case, but unquestionably, it's going to have an impact. And undoubtedly, uh, depending on how it shakes out, you're, you're going to see you're going to see additional filings from the SEC to Judge Torres. You can absolutely bet your bottom dollar on that one. And 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 so I want to share with you perspective also, and I'll start with this in this video uh, from. Uh, Deborah M M McCrimmon, there's an article shared by Stuart Alderati, who is Ripple's general counsel, so he's their top in-house legal guy, and uh, the website Modern Counsel had a story from Debra about Deborah M McCrimmon, and uh, she is an in-house attorney at at Ripple. And so, so, and so, mind you, just to be clear, that I don't see this all the time, but there have been a couple instances where there seems to have been confusion over. Uh, you know, lawyers working for Ripple and worker uh, and lawyers being employed by Ripple. And so Stuart Alderati and Deborah McCrimmon both are in-house lawyers at Ripple, but they also have separate legal teams that specialize in all sorts of security laws and that type of stuff. They're the ones that are leading the charge primarily against the SEC, but they are working in, in tandem with uh, Ripple's in-house legal team. But she she made some interesting points here. And, and not the least of which is the fact that the SEC has no business. Uh, they, they don't have power to be governing what they're attempting to govern. Congress never intended that for them to do what it is that they're doing. It's a tremendous overreach. But um, before going further, I do want to be clear. I do not have a legal or financial background of any kind. I am not offering legal or financial advice. And you definitely should not buy or sell anything because of anything I say, right? I'm just an enthusiast who enjoys making YouTube videos about crypto-related topics, but just as a hobby and just for fun. And so here's a link from Stuart Alderati linking to the story, and he wrote the following. Our very own Deborah McCrimmon, VP and Deputy General Counsel here at Ripple, gave insight into her experience as a litigator on the groundbreaking SEC lawsuit and how it has been the most interesting work over her 20-year career. And so I want to cover, I printed this thing up, and I wanted to cover just a, a few key parts rather than just read through the whole thing, and I got some points to make, and it's going to perfectly segue into what Library had to say, which again, admittedly, Sounds bleak, and it puts some things into perspective. But um, but again, I, I, I'll still end on a positive note, because I am still, though being grounded in reality and recognizing the seriousness of what's going on, what's at stake, I'm still an optimist that what should be done will ultimately be done, that there is actually a path forward here. The piece reads as follows, and I'll start right here for those of you looking on the screen. McCrimmon serves as the Vice President and Deputy General Counsel of Litigation and Employment at Ripple Labs, a San Francisco-based business-facing technology company leveraging crypto to transfer funds across international borders. Since its founding in 2012, Ripple uses crypto and blockchain solutions to improve moving value. McCrimmon initially joined Ripple in 2018 as Director of Litigation. Almost three years later, the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission sued Ripple. Can you imagine? <laughs> it was Can you imagine jumping into just a company like this, just an innocuous company? It's over 200 people, fine, you know, working there at the time. But still, that's technically a kind of a smaller business anyway. And so then to jump in there and then have the company grow now over 700 employees and then be in the <laughs> as a result of, of just choosing that employment opportunity, which is a great opportunity, no doubt but then being thrust into the greatest litigation action the SEC has brought in a non-fraud case in decades. That's, that's a crazy thing. Anyway, peace continues though. The SEC sued Ripple, alleging the company raised funds through an unregistered ongoing digital asset securities offering. 
The SEC contends that the digital asset XRP is an investment contract under the Securities Act. We vehemently disagree with that characterization, says the attorney. She spends most days managing Ripple's SEC litigation. We have been litigating with the SEC on that issue since late 2020, and we believe strongly that the SEC is wrong on both the facts and the law, explains McCrimmon. Now, the SEC is stretching the Howey test that determines whether or not something is an investment contract well beyond recognition, according to McCrimmon. They are reaching far beyond the authority that was granted to them by Congress and trying to regulate a space that Congress never intended them to regulate, asserts Mick Crimmon. And so, look, and th- let me just pause to note here. This is also why I've been noting that, and I, I know, fantasy land stuff, right? God forbid Congress do what they should be doing here. But, you know, what would what would would have prevented this in the first place, obviously, not to play Captain Hindsight, well, maybe, maybe play Captain Hindsight a little bit, is if the if Congress had just stepped in sooner and set clear rules of the road in, in, charge of, in terms of like who should be doing what. And then outside of that, obviously, if Gary Gensler weren't just a complete egomaniac and just, if he weren't just looking out for himself, if he weren't like effectively a sociopath, then I don't think that uh, he'd be behaving the way that he's behaving because Right now, it looks like he's just engaging in publicity stunts. He's taking on positions that are, you know, complete 180s from what he says he believed four years ago. And I, I don't think that he's being truthful. I think that if, if, if 2022 Gary Gensler argues 2018 era Gary Gensler, I, I mean, who wins there? Does the universe explode? I, I don't I don't <laughs> I just I don't believe that Gary's arguing things that he believes to be true right now. And so even if I thought he was wrong about things, certain things back in 2018, I, I, he didn't have anything at stake, not like this. And so he didn't know he'd be running the SEC. And so I think he was being a lot more truthful back then. But man, the way he's approaching things now is completely ridiculous. Just there's been so many opportunities to have prevented the ship from getting to the point where it's hit the iceberg here. But here it is, and we're sinking. We need, we need, we need a lot more lifeboats or something, man. But then also check out this quote from Deborah McCrimmon. She said, it's a cutting-edge industry defining case. It's going to be precedential, not just for Ripple, but for the entire crypto industry. It's being watched by the entire industry. So think about this. Um, and, and this is, you know, I'll just segue into the library comment now. And this is from just this morning. This is the official library count. And uh, of course, getting sued into oblivion by the SEC, albeit at a slow pace because the wheels of justice turn a bit slow here. And admittedly, on the surface, this might sound bleak, but check this out. This is what Library wrote. The judge on the SEC v. Library case works part-time and can take as long as he wants. An elderly part-time employee that doesn't understand blockchain will be determining the future of it for all of America. That's just how it works, and there's not much we can do about it. So look, admittedly, that doesn't, it's not the most positive message, but it's its pretty well grounded in reality. And so a, cu- a couple of things to take away here. Despite this being true, I, I have seen perspective from attorney John Deaton on this in the past, and he was in the courtroom um, when, uh, w- with the SEC, he just, it's just, and again, I know it's the, the library case, but John Deaton, in a show of support, went to uh, the, the court event, however many months ago, I can't remember how long it's been at this point, but libraries there with uh, with Jeremy Kaufman, the SEC was there, and he heard the arguments that were made. And I do recall Deaton kind of delivering a message that it seemed like the judge was really doing his best to actually genuinely understand what's going on. And he did seem to have some pushback against the SEC in terms of what if there's utility, this and that, what are the implications? So not to make it out as though the judge in the SEC v. Library case is some sort of bumbling fool, but he jumped into a highly consequential case uh, with technology underlying everything that he started out with a, like, a blank slate. That's kind of intimidating. How long did it take you listening to this to have a reasonable handle on anything doing with to, to do with crypto? You know, it's it's not it's not easy to understand. And so for someone like that, and you know, it's it's certainly. Um, 
not not to disparage the elderly like that's not the point it's just it's a there is a generational thing i know that there are all sorts of elderly people that are well informed and tech savvy but you know there's a sort of generational thing and i i don't know i mean how many of your grandparents out there if you're in your like 30s or 20s or 30s are internet savvy and blockchain savvy well probably not that many and it's not to disparage anybody it's just kind of how things are you get used to what you grew up with throughout life, and then the new generation has a new thing, and that's just that's how it goes. I can only imagine what the people that are being born now will be interested in that I'm just not going to get another 40 years from now. And I'm 39 years old as I record this. But um, it, this thing's going to take a while, perhaps. Don't know how long. We don't have a deadline, which is unfortunate. So there's nothing the judge has to adhere on in that front. And in some sense, that might be reasonable just because I'd rather have it done right then quickly, so okay, I suppose there, though it's unfortunate to not, not to have, even if it's a really long deadline. But my gosh, when you think about it like this, somebody that didn't really know anything about blockchain jumping in and then having this type of power. And, and here, here's the thing, though. This is kind of the reality of justice anyway. So if you're not going to have a jury trial and you're going to have something just decided, um, you know, it's summary judgment, which can make a lot of sense, uh, it's, it's a matter of fact that no matter what aspect of law that you're talking about, it does come down to a human, and all humans are fallible. So I, I believe in most cases, you do get positive and correct outcomes, but we're all human. All these judges, these are not some sort of wizards. They, they, are, they are regular humans, and maybe they're highly intelligent. Hopefully, the vast majority, I think the vast majority actually are, but they're fallible. And so you can get, and so that's what's intimidating about this. And so that's why, like I said at the outset, it's not that everything's super duper tremendously bleak. It's just concerning to some degree because you can get a bad ruling. So I'll feel a lot better when this whole thing's done because it's, it's gonna, like I said, it's gonna have an impact on the entire crypto asset class. And I am thinking bigger. It's so like, fine. I, I'm thinking about XRP because I, I hold XRP and I have for many, many years. It's important to me. It's important to a lot of people for the financial interests of many of you listening out there. I do understand that. Of course, of course. And that's perfectly reasonable. But even bigger than that, even though XRP is my favorite crypto and largest holding, I understand that if things don't go well for library and they don't go well for, for Ripple and XRP holders, which is a possibility. I don't think that's probable, but it's possible. If it actually goes really, really poorly, then I think that everything else that all of us listening here, listening here hold in terms of cryptos... I, I'm going to be alarmed. Like I will at that point, I would be seriously alarmed and be considering based on the information that has evolved to that point. I'll be thinking about whether or not I should have any of my net worth in crypto at that point, you know, except for maybe Bitcoin, if it's the, the chosen one, that's not going to get attacked. And that's pitiful. I shouldn't be put in that situation. Neither should you. None of us should be put in that situation, but that's what we're looking at here potentially. And it just, it really grinds my gears folks. And so in library putting this out, and I'm not being like super duper critical here. So I've seen, I, I read a number of the comments under this and some people were questioning, why would you say something that might be perceived as disparaging to the judge? Well, a couple ways to, to, cons to consider that. Um, and I, I can't speak on behalf of library, of course not, but probably the judge isn't going to see that. But even if the judge is going to see that, they're not supposed to rule on things that might make them feel an emotion. But it does also make me think back to something I said just a couple of minutes ago. They shouldn't, keyword shouldn't, but they're human and they're fallible just like anyone else. They can get offended and it could impact, even if they don't even realize it at that point, it could to some degree impact the way that they rule. So if it were me, I wouldn't be tweeting out that stuff, but I'm not trying to be hypercritical. I'm, I'm really not. The, the library, they're right on this. I'm not disputing the point that they're making. I'm just, when it comes to me, like just how I am by nature, I'm hyper conservative when it comes to be like, if I were in this situation, I would just shut my damn lips. <laughs> and again, I, I promise I like library. I'm not saying that to be disparaging at all. I back them 100% and it's their right to say publicly whatever they want. And they should live in a world where they can. I'm just acknowledging that the reality is that there are some humans that will make decisions based on emotions. Now, hopefully you're not going to typically see that as much in a judge, but it's certainly possible. That's why I'm saying it's like, even if it's highly improbable that in any way this would impact the case, I like to have as close to 0% risk exposure or additional risk exposure as possible. So it's just like a, a general way of thinking through things. But, you know, you're going to have opinions on that topic in all directions. And whatever you think, I'm not saying you're wrong. That's why it's kind of subjective, really. But uh, I am curious to hear what you think.
I'll go ahead and wrap up there, but look, I'm still an optimist for the future and what's going to happen here, but I want to stay grounded in reality. Uh, and also, I will, actually, let me say this too, though. The good news is, additional good news, it's not the only good news, <laughs> is that I think that the judge in the SECV library case here, um, I think it's been made very clear to him how impactful this is, how many people have interests, how, how this is being viewed by just an incredibly large number of people in the in the public sphere. I think he gets that. There are a lot of eyeballs on this, and he, he's probably, you would think, to be to some degree feeling pressure and trying to do his best to make sure he gets this right, which is why, again, like I said, take the time if you need the time here. But I think understanding the gravity of the situation would make any human, you know, even if you should, in theory, you know, a lot, put forth the same amount of diligence for any case, in theory, I think when you understand the gravity of something like this, you're probably a little bit more likely to just be like, okay, let's dot the I, let's cross the T. You know what I mean here? I'm not, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm not a financial advisor. You should not buy or sell anything because of anything that I say or write. That would be a very, very, very bad idea. Until next time, to the moon Lambo.